Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramph. I'm here to usher you into the weekend. It is pretty much the end of September and the beginning of October as we head into the weekend. And we're in the last leg of the mile in terms of the farmer's market, people's market, and the downtown uh, River Street market. For those of you interested in doing the market stuff, a great way to get to uh, uh, farm to table, direct farm stands, and all sorts of different fun, unique uh, knickknacks and things made here in Missoula, Montana. So farmer's market every Saturday till the end of October. And it's a, I always like to advocate for that because it's a big part of downtown Missoula for sure. All right, so jumping in, uh, Monday, NASA shot a spacecraft at an asteroid uh, seven million mi miles away. So basically, they're just saying, it's like, hey, we need to uh, think about uh, potential uh, asteroids that might impact Earth at any given time. Is there anything we could do to them or interact with them in any way? So scientists. Uh, developed a planetary defense system that was teased back in 2021. Um, they found the perfect test subject uh, through the uh, two uh, um, big um, asteroids. One, it was the, the whole idea is this Dimorphos and then Dimorphosis. It's, it's very weird because one is bigger than the other and the smaller one is about as big as a football field. And what they basically did is they wanted to hit it to see if, they, if the uh, spacecraft could uh, basically change its uh, trajectory. And the cool thing is, is that they got a couple pictures leading up to it. So if we take a quick look, we can kind of see, um, let me just bring it up a little bit better. Um, from the uh, left, you see it's the probably that's like uh, hundreds of miles away. And then when you get a little bit closer, um, you're basically, you know, the, this is a telescope that's uh, retrofitted on a, a satellite as it's heading towards the rock itself. And as you can see, you know, it's, it's a pretty much an egg shape. And then if you get really close, it kind of looks like just a generic old gravel that you would just see on the ground. So they knocked it off its course. And, you know, they, they won't know for sure until uh, two months from now if they even altered the course of the asteroid in the first place. Because they basically said it's like crashing a golf cart into a... Um, um, pyramid, but of course in space, you know, the one with the most kinetic energy usually affects the ones right next to it. I don't know that much about science or anything like that, but I just have a, a, sne a sneaking suspicion. They do have a video of the actual impact because they got a secondary satellite to do it uh, to get another picture of it. You basically see some of the uh, dust coming from the uh, impact. And yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's all a wait and see kind of process. Coming back to Earth, where our problem seems small in the grand scheme of things, the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict goes into an interesting phase as uh, uh, acts of violence within the Russian uh, community uh, uh, in opposition to the uh, uh, draft. Uh, recruitment offices have been attacked by gunmen and Molotov cocktails just recently. Mass shootings in si Siberian recruitment office has resulted in a six-year attempted murder, but still no, not as bad as dodging of the draft, which is about 10 years in prison. You might even have heard that Russia has recruited inmates uh, to the armed forces with the promise of freedom. So in many ways, they could also use this as a, uh, a pipeline for getting a lot of uh, Russian men aged about 18 to 35 to uh, be within the fighting age to go to the border. So so at the border, many have fled, and those young men are fighting of a fighting age have been told to turn back, or they've actually set up recruitment offices at these uh, stations as well. Uh, the U.S. did it before when uh, we're, a lot of uh, young men were trying to escape Vietnam War going to Canada, which I thought was pretty interesting too. But uh, we're going back uh, to uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, you know, a lot of the laws and all the things are coming into place, like one of the big things is that spreading misinformation as a penalty to up to 15 years in prison. So there's a lot of uh, rules being made up on the spot as we're getting in into more of this stuff. And political analyst Abbas uh, Galimov, um, who told AP News, Putin is risking a lot by announcing mobilization. He's losing support. He's creating a pre-revolutionary situation. Protests, arson incidents at Elizabeth's offices, end quote. Um, and, you know, that's just kind of what's happening there. There's a lot of moving parts. There's always a lot of information that's not being uh, said and a lot of things going on here as well. So uh, this is uh, as this is kind of like the bigger things that are happening over in the Ukraine-Russian uh, conflict. So here at home, uh, one of the big things is that Hurricane Ian landed in Florida this week. The 155-mile-per-hour uh, Category 4 hurricane made landfill Wednesday. Utility trucks in the hundreds were ready to take on the aftermath near uh, Sumter County, Florida. 
in this consistently hit areas of the Florida coast. Uh, this is going to, uh, according to uh, Florida Governor uh, Ron DeSantos, this is going to be a nasty uh, day, two days. Start seeing that people in Ian's path along the coast should rush to safest possible shelter and stay there. Uh, more than 2.5 million people were under mandatory evacuation orders. Hurricanes in Florida are natural to the area, but every once in a while there's always a big storm that really makes landfall and really carries on, which uh, even now South Carolina is under a major warning as uh, they expect to have... Um, the hurricane uh, coming across South uh, Southern uh, Southern South Carolina soon. So that's kind of what's happening there. I, I don't have too much news to talk about. I'm stretching a little bit of a couple of the main topic of news things, but I also wanted to mention that the MCAT is uh, also going to be uh, facilitating uh, Wednesdays with the city, which used to be called Wednesdays with the mayor. And so this is a great way for people to engage with their uh, city officials and government through an open uh, discord here at the public library every last Wednesday of the month. So here's a little taste of uh, Jordan Hess, Mayor Jordan Hess, who is talking a little bit more about about um, redevelopment in the Missoula area. Hold on a second. Where the solution, if you're moving in especially unique areas, mm -hmm. you better do it now than 10 years from yeah. now. Yeah, something like that when you've had already more redevelopment. You know, you look at Russell Street, and that was a, that was a good mm -hmm. example of the, the first phase of Russell Street from, from the river to, um, to the third but almost um, that was a good example of um, a process that was a process. and and there's there's federal um, you know NEPA and different there's there's a lot of there's a lot that goes into these projects um, and so it will be a, a process you know it'll be a process and if there are right-of-way needs that'll be that'll be um, certainly part of that that planning process Okay, so uh, mind you that uh, some of the uh, uh, audio that I'm experiencing is having some kind of, it's not necessarily uh, the audio problem, it's, gonna, it's just a buffering problem on my computer. I'm making it run pretty hard. But yeah, those are the infer that's uh, some of the stuff that they will be talking about, redevelopment, a lot of different things. And in my city council report, one of the major things that I'm gonna be talking about is the Midtown Master Plan, which is uh, maybe adopting some of the uh, ideas from what we did down for the Downtown Master Plan, which is really emphasize growth inward, but with Midtown, it's kind of like the areas in which they're going to talk a little bit more about that during my city council report. So uh, that's uh, that's all the news I have for you guys today. Um, up next, we have a bunch of series of shorts made by the kids of our Saturday drop-in. So here's this, uh, and then when I come back, we're going to talk about some movies that are coming out.
Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, yeah, Saturday drop-ins every Saturday here at MCAT from uh, 1 to 3. Your kid ages about 8 to 14 can get a great experience doing some stop animation and perhaps learn a couple of uh, video making things. So moving on, we're going to jump right into some, some movies that are coming out this weekend. This is by far going to be the funniest movies of all time because it's original and it hasn't been done before. So rom-coms, Get out of the way, because here's a rom-com. Welcome to the world of straight people. Gross are not in this movie to darken our theaters with their breeding and binary. Um, enjoy Bros, which follows a gay man falling for a man who happens to be gay. There's a difference. Watch the trailer. Um, in this comedy romance rom-com in the New York gay scene where there's basically doing When Harry Met Sally, um, enjoy Billy on the street becoming a freak in the sheets in this totally romantic movie between two people trying to make it work in this crazy, crazy world. Leave them alone because they are going to have a great relationship. Uh, get tested in the most rom-com rom -com kind of way that can only be resolved with a grand gesture. Moving on, we got Vesper. Alien apocalyptic movie about humans rising up after they lost the big battle. Let's do a post-apocalyptic but with aliens again. Enjoy a series of revolutionary war inspired tropes and people fighting for their planet and be like, we've been infighting with each other for all this time. Let's get together and fight these aliens off our planet. Uh, anyways, um, this plot follows a magic kid with plot armor to get the thing to the thing and um, this is what happens when you try to storm Area 51 people. I swear, I swear. Um, while you're watching Aliens and people trying to make it work, Dead for a Dollar, starring Christoph Waltz, hmm, Western, hmm, not Tarantino film, ugh. But um, bounty hunting, gambling, and Old West tropes, and hey, there's uh, Willem Dafoe's in this movie. I like Willem Dafoe. Um, Argentina, 1985. Do you like movies that dramatize history lessons? Come on. Give it a chance. That's called Based on a True Story, folks. And this film follows a war, but not the war. The war is aftermath in terms of lawyers and such fighting against corrupt governments and the military. So enjoy that uh, snore fest. Uh, we have Devil's Workshop. You like those annoying actors? Uh, get their comeuppance. Um, enjoy an actor go method by being possessed by a demon. How uh, about being a better actor and just act like you're being possessed rather than going through the whole process of actually being possessed. Uh, wolf Pack, Chinese propaganda action film uh, with the word wolf in the title, something to do with a terror plot and elite Chinese military squad to send to defeat them. If you like Wolf Warrior 3, 12, 27, you might like Wolf Pack. So it might even be a prequel to uh, Wolf Warrior, who knows. All right, so those are some of the movies that are coming out this weekend. I have my own uh, re-edited, uh, re redubbed uh, movie from the uh, movie, 1970 horror film, I Eat Your Skin. So here's this, and then when I come back, we're gonna talk about some city council stuff. And to think I let you guys into my home, and you eat, and you eat my food, and you disrespect me in my home, and uh, the least you can do is, you know, eat the whole chicken, not just the skin. He's standing there judging us with a Hugh Hefner robe on. What are you trying to prove? 
I just don't want to see good food go to waste. You understand that, don't you? Yeah, you're just like my father. Eat everything on your plate. Food doesn't grow on trees. Oh, come on now. Once a gift is given, one can do whatever they want with their gift. Even if they don't want to eat it all. You know, you've really opened my eyes. I'm really sorry about- It's okay. She just needs to lie down. And everything. <laughs> Why do you yell at me? He's just stressed do out. He's the wrong. host. What do you expect? This isn't the party I wanted. In fact, this is not much of a party after all. You can leave if you want to. No need to stick around for this awkwardness. I'm, I'm just going to go and turn in and read a nice book. Ooh, War and Peace. I hope my next party will be better than this. Maybe I'll have rotisserie chicken instead of... No, never mind. I got a good book. You know, I've never actually read War and Peace. I just like to have it in the bookshelf to make people think I'm cultured and whatnot. So, yeah, here, check out this uh, insert. War and Peace kind of covers the uh, Napoleon War as it invaded Russia in 1812. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. And this is all you really need to know about this particular book before, you know, to sound somewhat cultured. War and Peace kind of feels like the kind of book that people say they read, but they didn't really need to read but still understand the concept of what they read. Because, you know, once you uh, understand what the book's about, you kind of get the gist of it. And in this acknowledgement, it says, all in all, you can really basically read anything about the history of Napoleon and get the gist of war and peace. So don't bother reading this book. After all, it is just a really important book in history, but it's also more of a fiction about something realistic. Oh, you mean like uh, From Here to Eternity and Captain America during World War II? Is that kind of what you mean by, you know, uh, fictionalizing history and whatnot? Are you talking about like Hemingway? Is that like a Hemingway? That's the guy who wrote the acknowledgement. Well, Hemingway was the master of shade after all. Was Hemingway just a critic in the end? Well, we all become the things we fear the most, and uh, Hemingway was not shy of becoming a critic just like those who'd criticize him did you know he punched a guy oh yeah his name was stephen wallace he got a chance to get revenge on hemingway but then he broke his hand on his jaw now that's a party yeah that's very interesting i'm going to learn to say told story five times real fast please excuse me told story told story story told 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 story told Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk a little bit about some city council stuff. So I don't actually have much from uh, the city council meeting, but the community meetings were pretty thick with a lot of great uh, content, which involved the uh, Midtown Master Plan. So right now, I just want to talk about some of the stuff that the city is uh, spending money on in terms of the consent agenda. So we spend a lot of money from accounts payable to new equipment for an upcoming winter season. $1.7 million alone went to accounts payable, roughly $100,000 for various equipment and projects that span from pedestrian bridge to on the north side. Uh, a new snowplow for $61,000 and contracts with various developers on the uh, Trout's Unlimited $125,000 cap for restoration and cleanup of uh, McKinley Link, which was associated with Rattlesnake in the part of the dam removal and restoration process. They are also working in tandem with uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Park on this process. So. First public hearing, uh, uh, um, you know, I'm just going to gloss over some of the details, and but the most part is that TDS Television is in the final reading for the arrangement with the city franchise through the city and created a, a competition with Charter Spectrum, who has a monopoly on cable TV in Missoula. So overall, this would provide money for MCAT services. Um, I mean, of course, I like to stress that MCAT only exists because of you watching Charter Cable at home. If you're watching this on YouTube, stop it. You have to watch on Charter Cable in Missoula, Montana, um, and I don't know what channel Channels or what TDS will actually go, when will that we actually go live? I'm expecting sometime maybe in um, or early maybe 2024, who knows? But they're renting the right of way, which is the cable lines that are owned by the city, which is also being rented and franchised out to um, Charter Spectrum, which is why MCAT gets this money in the first place. So no taxes. Um, and so that's kind of what they're moving for. for. There's not much fanfare. The city moved to uh, create this new uh, deal welcoming the TDS uh, channel. 
uh, TDS cable company. So Block Grant wraps up their report and speaks about most things I've covered last Friday, but housing stock is going up and it will be more, more than 600 dwelling units in the spring of 2023 with the Trinity Apartments and also the uh, additional apartments they're building off of Mullen. Uh, this whole uh, Mullen Street project is such a big 54 acres of uh, prime land that's going to be used for this kind of development. So we're actually going to see the fruits of this labor come to fruition spring 2023. So as of right now, it's going to be very interesting hunkering down during the winter in very uh, um, an erratic kind of housing market. So uh, Mayor Jordan Hess reflects on uh, this and uh, the city of Missoula. These, these programs are impactful programs that do good work in our community. And I want to thank Ms. Lysom and um, and the rest of um, her team um, for um, the work to implement. Um, spending federal money is, is um, complicated and um, and the impact is um, is felt, and so I want to I want to thank um, everyone in the in in that program for um, their work administering these complicated grants and um, and for bringing this forward tonight. Yes, so a lot of those grants that went to a lot of these affordability projects and whatnot, and you know, I mean, a big chunk of what happened during the uh, ARPA and CARES Act funding was meant for a lot of these housing crises and people getting evicted. But a lot of times when the money gets injected, you also have to let it trickle down and get redistributed by the state level. And in many ways, I think uh, from what the city of Missoula has said in many times is that the state of Montana has withheld a good amount of money that could have been done to really help our community. And so how is this talk go up well, next spring? And we can expect a lot of wheels moving towards better living arrangements and larger markets for renters to dip into rather than being on a long waiting list. Another big change in the city is how they plan to move into the old federal post office building downtown. The proposed Missoula local government building special district uh, will uh, encompass only a single uh, currently federal property at the 200 East Broadway. Thus, it will not be a tool for levying assessment on other property owners, but rather the mechanism in enabling the city and county to jointly own and operate the site and building. So basically, you know, they make special districts which are taxable and then um, for uh, general zones, but then the special district is just going to encompass this block around the city. And so city and county who are owners, entity owners, will be paying into this uh, special district like tax money towards like the state it's 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 interesting how they're going about doing this but john adams strategic uh, project administrator who's been talking about this in length uh, talks about how the fed needs one owner which is why the city and county need to create this district in the first place so here's john adams so special districts created under this authority are discrete legal expressions of local government that depending on the authority delegated to them can implement programs, administer budgets, employ personnel, purchase property, et cetera. So typically we see them deployed for a single particular need, uh, such as um, rehabilitation of the fairgrounds, or for a discrete geographic, something that's um, as a discrete geographic need, like a local park. Okay. So, you know, like it's, you know, it's connectivity and, you know, I, honestly, the uh, Missoula Parks and Rec are a great example of uh, working in uh, parks and in their own district, which don't necessarily just encompass the city, but also the county as well. So, you know, Fort Missoula Regional Park is a prime example of county slash city investment moving forward with uh, the inner, like an inner local agreement. So, in many ways, Parks and Rec are a great example. John Adams goes into details about the city and county's agreement in terms of, you know, like in, deci in deciding whether or not, hey, what if, you know, one person decides to back out and what would happen, you know, you know, like, you know, the city and county are tight right now, but in for the for the uh, in layman's terms, they're two different entities. They're like completely two different governing bodies, and so you know you have uh, it's it's like moving in with your best friend uh, or something like that, and you're like I don't know about this, and then you 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 just have to decide. There's gonna be some growing pain. Some uh, uh, people are gonna yeah. We'll see how it works out. So here's John Adams again. The interlocal establishes that the city and county. We'll pay ongoing costs for operating the building based on the square feet each entity is utilizing in the building with a default starting point of 50-50. The interlocal lays out the process by which either the city or county could withdraw from the special district. The idea here is that the withdrawing party would be compensated for the value of improvements that it's contributed to the building, appropriately depreciated, but would not receive any compensation for the value of the building itself. Yeah. So there you go. So, you know, like they're invested in the city and any and they get a return on their investment. But um, if they uh, decide to leave it, 
it, it, it's basically like, it's like, well, one of us is, uh, owns this. It's the last man standing in this district. Uh, whoever, if, they, if one decides to leave, the other one basically gets the building. I, I, that's interesting how they're wording this, but I don't know if it's exactly that. Uh, don't, don't take my word for it, but it kind of sounds like that for sure. So overall, the special district will own the building and the city and county will manage it and pay for it 50-50. And it seems interesting, like it's like every square foot, uh, you know, improvements in development, it, it, you know, you, you got to keep those receipts for sure. So, you know, uh, it's interesting how it's going to, it could potentially be overly complicated which um, I think I'm making it overly complicated in my own head too. So in the end, the meeting, uh, uh, the city moved to speak about the empty seat in council and how they plan to fulfill it. And on Wednesday, they uh, had the process of going through uh, War II candidates and nominations and stuff like that. So Monday, they will have the final adoption and they'll do that final vote on whether or not who, who they're going to have for the replacement in War II. And so I guess the criteria for it was essentially you have to be within the university district, which is not just the university, but also some of the surrounding areas in that particular area too. So um, let's talk about housing. And this is a big one because we're going to jump right into... Um, um, Midtown. The main story from this meeting was Midtown, parts of Missoula from the fairgrounds onward that saw large upswings in businesses from the mall in the 80s to ShopGo being one of M Missoula's first retail stores. So uh, Melanie Brock uh, gave the overview of this particular area and uh, just kind of a, a, just a nice introduction for uh, Midtown. Area from Mount South with Higgins as our eastern border and Reserve Street on our west. We have vibrant neighborhoods and a bustling commercial sector and a highway that runs through it right here in the center of Missoula. Um, for the past two years, we have been working on the idea of a master plan to have a cohesive vision for growth and redevelopment of this area of Missoula. Um, it started with a feasibility study and we heard a resounding yes from the community that all of Missoula County wanted a master plan for Midtown. We launched a steering committee that expanded out of the association and brought together community partners, businesses, developers onto a steering committee. And we've been so grateful to have Council President Jones and Councilwoman Cheryl. And there's just a lot of different organizations involved in this process. Um, the, uh, so far, they went through a series of outreach and community gathering opportunities to ask people and businesses what they want in this section of Missoula and Midtown, um, and what also they don't want uh, their uh, town to become in that sec section of the area. Uh, so Tyler Bump, with Echo Northwest, project manager, spoke about the early stages of this project, and so they're being contracted to come up with a uh, strategic plan for the Midtown Master Plan. Um, really, there's three key areas that we're focusing on right now, both in how we're uh, engaging with the community in the visioning process, and structuring the beginning of the plan through the plan alternatives around infrastructure, uh, development. Development is both what you see, the sort of scale and the size of the building, but what also goes in building. So thinking about both the use and the scale uh, and then placemaking. We've heard very clearly from folks so far that they want, folks in the community want uh, more places to gather, more places to see their neighbors, more places to see their friends. And they're really thinking about how to stitch the fabric of Midtown across some challenging um, streets, really. So how do you connect Brooks uh, across Brooks and some of the neighborhoods and communities and assets at Midtown? All right, so uh, that was uh, Tyler. And uh, one of the big things, especially about Missoula, just a little bit of history lesson is, you know, Brooks and Higgins are based on the people, the founders of Missoula. And one thought, it was like, oh, why don't you just go north to uh, north south to north and all that stuff and then you know have one giant road that went from north to south and then you have that higgins street which kind of goes across the river and through the town and so uh, in a lot of ways like the town was built on two really uh, interesting roads and then we just had to build a city around those two uh, um, um, contrary opinions on which way the uh, road should go in missoula so it's an interesting history lesson but uh, it's definitely something that uh, um, it's basically two guys who couldn't agree on anything, and that's why we have the um, the system in Midtown the way it is. <laughs> so as we expect our population housing stock over the next couple years to grow, this project offers a glimpse into filling in and expanding these areas to accommodate folks. Uh, Brooks itself is a, not a very fun road to cross when walking, especially when you get into um, the Rose Park area near Hellgate. Tyler uh, Bump uh, talks a little bit more about uh, the YMCA event, which had the outreach for many people to kind of uh, give their input to um, 
to this Midtown Master Plan? Um, so there's a couple photos that I have here, folks engaged at the different stations that we had. So it was a really sort of participatory workshop that we had with folks showing up on those different topic areas that I, that I mentioned earlier. Um, the thing that I really appreciated about the attendees that came out for the workshop is that everybody went to every station. Everybody was involved in the parking conversation. Everybody was involved in the design conversation. Everybody was involved in transportation. Uh, sometimes in these kinds of events that I've worked before, there are a lot of folks come in with one issue and they'll go to that table, they'll voice their opinion and they'll leave. But the entire everybody that came through did the entire circle. Um, All right. So uh, Missoula itself has always been very invested in uh, what their city looks like. And there's always a good amount of people, too. Um, this kind of reminds me of another time when the downtown master plan was being spoken about, is that they had over 3,600 uh, participants in Missoula, which, you know, many of you might be like, I was like, okay, 3,600 of like 100,000 people in all of Missoula for the downtown master plan. But that's a lot, of, that's even better than it was in uh, their previous uh, work in associate, which did the places like Miami, Florida, which has a more than 10 times the amount of population, but saw less input from the community on their downtown master plan. So think about that in terms of how many people are invested into the city of Missoula versus, you know, other communities. So per capita, Missoula definitely has a higher uh, amount of people who are heavily invested in this. So Tyler reflects on what people actually value for this uh, Midtown master plan. And this is what he had to say. But We'd have folks, you know, interested in single family development. And we'd have folks interested in five story development in the same location. And so what that tells me is that there is an interest and a need to think about different housing options uh, for different folks. Everybody has different needs. And that was also reflected in some of the questions we asked about priorities for housing, for example. So we had another exercise that what are your key priorities that are most important to you for housing or for commercial in Midtown? Uh, affordability was the single biggest issue. Frankly. All right, so uh, Tyler, you know, of course, you know, that's one of the big things that are happening right now is, you know, Missoula Housing Authority during the pandemic uh, said that housing is very expensive. And as a result, a lot of the houses in Missoula started selling for higher and higher. You know, in some cases, you know, some people were just like, oh, first sale by owner is a lot easier deal. But then, you know, when you get a realtor involved, it's like, hey, you can make some more money with this thing. And there's just, there's just so much problems when it came to people, even especially from uh, outside Missoula buying up housing in in Missoula. I'm not saying that people shouldn't want to move here, but we should try to help the people who actually live here. Anyways, that's just my opinion. Let's move on. Uh, public safety and health. And, you know, one of the biggest things that are happening within public safety and health is um, um, Bear Smart. You know, we're getting bigger, our city is growing, our community is growing. And with that, we're uh, uh, basically starting to butt heads with more and more wildlife. Urban deer population is a huge problem. And then now we're getting some, some something anywhere between uh, uh, 40, 50 bears in the Missoula area. And now even grizzly bears are starting to uh, start uh, hibernating, kind of uh, be in the journal area uh, as of late. So uh, last month, these guys came down from the uh, Bear Smart Bear Management and they've uh, basically quoted in in terms of bear removal and handling the bear and animal control um, the city has cost uh, the state fifty thousand dollars in terms of uh, bear um, uh, what's that called bear um, dealing with the bears so anyways uh, for bear smart Chris uh, Severin uh, talks a little bit more about this and uh, some of the areas in Missoula that have uh, more of the challenging areas with bears our analysis area was not only the Missoula city area proper, but we used the uh, the most recent planning area map as a basis for looking at uh, as the hazards as well as the solutions to the hazards that we will present to you. Okay, so um, I just wanted to kind of give you that quote, but also show you guys the map itself. They said that Grant Creek is uh, one of the higher areas. Um, Rattlesnake is the, the, the biggest area in terms of um, human interaction with bears, um, and even in terms of uh, uh, even Paddy Creek Road in which they uh, source in this median as well as the main um, uh, source of like toppled over garbage cans and just overly dealing with it because um, in, in many ways, no matter what you do, a lot of times if you leave the garbage can out for any a period of time, they're going to jump the, the bears and other animals are going to just turn it over and eat out of it. So Rattlesnake Grand Creek are considered conflict sites. And since there were less berries this year, bears are seeking more and more food sources. And so they got less food from up in the mountains. And now they're basically looking at anywhere and any opportunity to basically get this. And, 
and they are common in Paddy Creek Road with the lots of turned over trash cans off of the thing, like I said. Chris also speaks about the amount of bears and how they relate to a growing Missoula. To complete this, it was written by the working group, and um, it is to guide you folks toward effective strategies to minimize conflicts. There are a lot of bears in Missoula right now. I think Jamie mentioned there's probably 30 to 40 black bears in Missoula right now, maybe even more. Um, um, so there's there's an issue related to this, and it's a, a problem of sanitation. It's certainly a, a public safety problem, and it's getting worse as we get more and more people that are here that don't know anything about bears and how to live with bears. And um, uh, these bears are getting bolder and, and more conflict prone. Yep. And so, you know, like one of the big things is, especially in terms of wildlife management in the state of Montana, is that if a bear is habituated with, you know, uh, food from trash cans or anything like that and have become a problem, most of the time they do pick them up and they send them miles away and they tag them. And if they, it's usually like a three strike rule and three strikes, they euthanize a lot of the bears. So um, they, they just cannot handle like having bears in captivity or anything like that. It, it's, it's, it's a very kind of a uh, interesting kind of thing about working with that kind of stuff. So, um, so far this presentation was made to put forward a plan that will provide education and outreach to folks in these and surrounding areas. Uh, where public service actually talks about bear-proof uh, um, trash cans. Uh, Chad Bauer from the uh, working group uh, uh, spoke about this a little bit more. We have adequate supply and we can get adequate supply to cover any of the new buffer zone. And um, I will just say currently we are maxed out at requests for bear-resistant containers and cards at this point. So they're going out as fast as we can get them in. Great, great. All right. And so, you know, like uh, the, the, even t in terms of supply, bear proof uh, supply, um, uh, trash cans, and they don't have the smaller bins for like individual trash can. They have the kind of like the more commercial and residential, you know, like those giant bins they would have for the uh, groups. And, you know, and Chad also blamed whitefish community for the lack of supply in terms of the bear proof cans. Uh, Gwen Jones talks about the timeline and Shannon from the health department responds to this and they kind of go uh, an interesting back and forth. So this is uh, some of the things that uh, the city has been inquiring about. We kind of have this like we're at the end of September. We have the situation we're in right now versus holistically setting us up, up to be better next year in terms of bear proof containers and fruit trees and bird feeders and and I'm not sure how far down the road you are, but could, what are you visualizing for short after we get this done with the county commissioners, short term versus long term? And what, sure. what are we looking at to really implement this? OK, well, I would say um, a couple of things. Shortest term is going on right now, which is um, the Patty Canyon South Hills. We tip We just historically have not done a lot of enforcement of the existing uh, requirements for the existing bear buffer zone there. Um, and so we have sent out or are in the process of, of sending out um, almost 2,000 um, letters to let people know that they live in the bear buffer zone, the existing bear buffer zone, and that both they have to deal with their garbage in a certain way. And then it talks about other attractants. So we're doing that and we can expand that to other areas in the existing buffer zone. But we just wanted people to be aware right now they are in the buffer zone. All right, and so what part of that is that, you know, they wanna make sure that people are educated and big thing in terms of that. And, um, you know, the future will also include a county input and through this rezoning, the city will be able to uh, require bear proof containers. And so you gotta, you, you, you I'm going to say that again. Require bear proof containers might be within these bear buffer zones. 50% of all bear related problems all have to do with trash cans, turnover trash cans. And if we can at least solve that, that would make a good uh, solution to a lot of things. Fruit trees, uh, another thing, as uh, Gwen Jones uh, brought up during uh, the media as well, they did. A, uh, they also showed a graph during this meeting that showed all the uh, additional problems that are there. Uh, and it's not necessarily because, uh, you know, 50 percent, 49 percent, to be more specific, is the uh, trash can, um, lack of trash can infrastructure for bear proofing. Um, and then you have, uh, sorry, I'm. And then one of the big things is bird feeders, um, fruit trees, and anything that kind of has, you know, you produce your own food. 
heck, even if you wanted to have your own small garden, and that even could be an, an issue in the long term as well. So there's just, you just can't win out there. You just can't win. And uh, if you want to know more about this, um, you can go on to uh, the City of Missoula's website, ci.missoula.mt.us, to learn more about your City of Missoula. Um, I'm going to kind of cut it off short there. There's a lot more information right there. And like I said, you could always check out uh, the City of Missoula's website. You can go to uh, EngageMissoula.com to find out more information about many things that are happening within the, the city of Missoula, including the Midtown Master Plan, which is basically right on the splash page. You give your input. Um, even if you can't attend any of those meetings, which they're going to be having more of those kind of frequently frequent meetings like they did at the YMCA here in Missoula. And so you guys can check that out and more. Up next, I do have a special video for you guys before I get into events. It is from the uh, Homecoming Parade. So here are some of the best highlights from the Homecoming Parade featuring our very own general manager here at MCAT, Joel Baird. Hi everyone, I'm Joel Baird, the general manager of Missoula Community Access Television. I want to thank you for tuning in to this Homecoming Parade. It's the first one in two years because the Bear Tracks Bridge is being worked on this summer. And it's not going to be quite ready uh, this morning. The parade route, parade the parade route is on South it's Avenue this year. Chelsea Bodner. Good morning. And the media arts major. Oh, and you see that beautiful sculpture entering the parade around now. This is, of course, that Great Divide trophy back where it belongs at the University of Montana. Some of the most hardcore Grizz fans coming down the route right now. Welcome our 2022 Distinguished Alumni Award winners as well. This year's recipients are Bob Tyson, very great. Hope to hear that one a lot in this day.
USA, one of the oldest organizations on campus, welcoming both American and international students for cross-cultural friendship, fun events, and community outreach. The University of Montana yearly enrolls over 400 international students and scholars from over 50 countries. The International Student Association is also the proud organizer of the popular Missoula event held each spring, UM World Fest. I always love watching this part because you think that's hard to do when everything's standing still. Imagine trying to do it while you're rolling down the road on the back of a train. All right, watch her. Oh my goodness. Watch her. Our members from Alpha Phi, founded at the U of N in 1918. We also got Phi Delta Theta, founded at UM in 1921, and Alpha Tau Omega, who we are excited to have reestablished at UM after a brief leave of absence. All right, Delta Gamma's here. Sigma Chi is here, founded in 1906. Sigma Nu Chapter, some of the over 300 students representing fraternity and sorority involvement at the University of Montana. All right, say hello to all nations health center. Committed to providing sustainable, healthy lives for our native people and the surrounding community through culturally based, holistic care. Been to the Forces Ball, you can't honestly say you're a Montanan. You gotta go to the ball. I've been to the ball. Have you been to the ball? I've been to the ball. We've been to the ball. I've been to the ball. I remember some of them, too. Thank you, everybody, for coming out and joining us for the homecoming parade today. Don't forget to make your way over to Washington Grizzly Stadium and cheer for those great Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for Missoula Community Access Television's coverage of the 2022 Homecoming Parade. And remember, MCAT is now located in the new Missoula Public Library. We're in the southeast corner of Level 1. If you're interested in any of our workshops, give us a call at 406-542-6228. For MCAT, I'm Joel Baird. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some events that are happening in and around the city of Missoula. It is time for events. Anyways, uh, hey, Autumn Conference is happening at the University of Montana. Hey, and at the University of Montana, uh, Autumn is basically their big season filming things, getting some drone shots of everything, whatnot. And so they're doing an annual conference happening from now until October 1st. So it's an in-person at the University Center. A virtual option is available for folks as well. You can look that up online. Um, so it's going to be starting at 9 a.m. today, and it will be an uh, open and free fall conference is now open. So this uh, li living well with Parkinson's and other mobility disorders, optimal nutrition, the importance of exercise, caregiver support. So all sorts of things happening that. Uh, there's just a little taste of what you guys can expect at the University Center. Um, uh, the Missoula Food Bank is continuing their operation um, well into the, through the school year. They did free meals for kids. They also do a lot of free meal kid programs with a flagship program, after school programs for the kids to provide uh, free nutritious food for kids just getting out of school who need a nice little uh, snack just before they head on home. So they're going to be doing that. Uh, reading with Empower Place is going to at 10.30 a.m. If you can't go to the Missoula Public Library, they have another reading and science-based activities at the Missoula Food Bank off Wyoming Street. Speaking of story time, you got Tiny Tales and Story Time here at the Public Library on the second floor starting at 1030 both Friday and Saturday every week. You guys can check it out. A great way to get kids involved with reading and engaged with books. Time, um, yarns and Watercolor. It's going to be uh, 12 noon on the fourth floor. Um, Lego Club is happening here at the library as well every Friday at 230 to about 5 um, here at the Missoula Public Library on the second floor. Most of these kids' activities are based on the second floor here at the library. Missoula uh, Makers Market is going to be at Pura Bulba and uh, Missoula Makers Collective. The Missoula, Mar Make uh, ooh, the Missoula Makers Market, try saying that five times fast, is a thoughtfully curated market of local handmade artists hosted in the summer and winter. The market seeks to showcase existing and emerging talent in the Missoula area in order to create visibly, uh, visibly uh, around mark... Ugh. Sorry, I gotta. We believe that the entire community benefits when you shop handmade, locally sourced stuff. Um, uh, Chris Audio closing reception and poetry slam, Gallery 709 um, inside the Montana Art and Framing um, is going to be uh, Chris Audio painted photographs in conjunction with the poetry slam. This is happening from 5 to 9 p.m. tonight. Poets include John Holbrook, 
uh, Her uh, Henrietta Goodman, Dave Thomas, Jade Taylor, Sean Gann, all sorts of fun things happening in the city of Missoula. Uh, live music, Sun Dog North is gonna be at Highlander Beer. Perma Red is gonna be at Radius Gallery. A book release celebration about the author Deborah Magpie Erling is a member of the Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes in Missoula. Uh, in Montana, uh, she's a bitter root Salish. Her novel, uh, Perma Red, uh, won in Western Writers Association Spur Award, WWA's Medicine Pipe Bearer Award for first novel, and you can check this out at the Radius Gallery for the reception starting at 6. Ashley McBeard, uh, sorry, um, Ashley McBeard is going to be featured at the Wilma Music Performance. Check that out. Um, for History Buffs, so this is a continuation of an, a program, uh, September's program uh, here at the Missoula Public Library starting at 7 p.m. tonight. A uh, brief review of the coming of the railroads in Missoula. Interested in railroad-related story, historic images, how the railroad culture lingers, and a review of the impending Montana Rail Link, Burlington to Northern Santa Fe, end of lease changeover, and how the changes to the rail scene in western Montana. Um, that's what's happening um, here at the library tonight at 7. Next to Normal, uh, it's going to be at Westside Theater next to Normal. They're doing a lot of interesting kind of like uh, um, plays and different um, niche kind of things over at the Westside Theater. Worth checking out, explores how one suburban household copes with a crisis and mental illness. Winner of three 2009 Tony Awards, including Best Musical Score in the and the 2010 Pulitzer Prize Award, and it's going to be presented by AM Theatrical. Um, live music, Blue Moon is going to be at the Old Post. A gay terror dance party pep rally for short skirts to track shoots, uh, shirts to skins. It's time to show your spirit and shake your pom-poms for gay terror, the dance party for queer and questioning, along with friends they have chose to bring. $10 uh, suggested donation, pay what you can. No one will be barred for not having the fees. No charge for BIPOC population. And it's going to be at the Zootown Arts Community Center tonight at 8 p.m. And in case you missed it, um, Home Resource Spontaneous Construction Exhibit will be featured at the Missoula Public Library throughout the month of, uh, through the, uh, the month of uh, October as they get auctioned off in the later of this month. And so we'll be here until October 21st. And join us to celebrate uh, Creative Reuse with Home Resource, the nonprofit working for sustainable in sustainability in Western Montana. The library will display functional art created during the Home Resource event, SpawnCon, held on September 17th. So it'll be here until the 21st of October, so you guys can check out all these exhibits here at the Missoula Public Library. Zootown Challenge, Oregon Park and Legion Field, starting with the VR TX Fitness. The race course encompasses Oregon Park, Allegiance Field is the baseball field, and the Riverfront Trail. Racers will experience the thrill of competing on the field, rushing to catch a fly ball, overcoming obstacles, and running along the picturesque Riverfront Trail. So this is happening at 10 a.m. at the Allegiance Field Baseball. So. Uh, starting at 10 a.m. So uh, Saturday, also the Tech Con Connect. Uh, this is a great way for people to uh, basically, if they're tech illiterate, become a little bit more uh, illiterate when it comes to tech. Missoula Public Library is hosting a series of classes to help you learn technology every uh, Saturday at 11 a.m. A great opportunity for a lot of people to get involved with that. Um, and for the most part, the only advice I can give you in terms of computers is like, don't be afraid of failure and I've, I've like if, if something goes wrong something goes wrong just push through you know it's you know think just you know think of it as just another tool uh, turner farms annual pumpkin patch uh 12 uh you know this is a big thing it's a a, a, a lot of interconnected uh, neighborhoods uh turner farms is a uh uh, is a great uh, kind of like farm stand um, neighborhood area just off of a third street down uh, towards Target Range and they do this well and through the October time great way to get a pumpkin uh, from their pumpkin patch and for the Halloween celebration so and also Saturday is the Apple Festival in Hamilton um, one of the best uh, apple picking events in Western Montana apple cider apple themed events in Western Montana it's gonna be happening all day starting early in the morning at the Hamilton um, in Hamilton so that's gonna happen on Saturday as well uh, there's also doing a harvest party at Western Cider is uh, and, and they're doing a, also their five-year anniversary so from two to six you got free Frito plot Frito uh, free Frito pies 
Uh, music by Wolf and the Moons at from uh, 2 to 4. Crank Apple Press Competition is going to be from 3 to 5 p.m. Um, uh, just a lots of prizes and bring your friends and someone. And this is a uh, yeah, this is a 21 and up event as well. As and while this is happening there, Karis Park is yep is doing another brew fest. Uh, not necessarily uh, it's a Montana Brewers Fall Rendezvous Brew Fest at 3 p.m. Enjoy Montana craft beers and hanging out with the breweries. And you and if you pay a little bit extra, you can go there from 3 to 4 p.m. And general admission starts from 4 to 8 p.m. All that happening at Karis Park. Buffalo Field Campaign 25th Anniversary Roadshow uh, at Free Cycles, all set for the new year. This is for a benefit for the U.S. Fish, Wildlife, and Park Service, as big as the assessing threats to Yellowstone's bisons because of the uh, persistent legal efforts. Uh, show starts at 6 p.m. The evening will have live music from Flashpan and 10 Cent Meal. Cover charge at the door will be $10, and the money will go towards U.S. Wildlife Services in terms of bison in Yellowstone, which is very... It's a very interesting story, but I don't want to get into it. Uh, Joshua Jabalsk, Jabro, uh, Jabrowski is going to be at Imagination Brewing Company playing some music. Live music with Travis Yost is going to be at Cranky Sound Public House. Todd Snyder with Nikki Bloom is going to be at The Wilma. Karaoke at West Side Lanes. Will and Aaron Jennings will be at Union Club. DJ Chris Moon every Saturday at The Badlander. I think even Joan Zen is playing tonight at Union Club. You may not want to double check that, but I think I saw it on the sandwich board while I walked past the Union Club the other day. Rocktober dance party with DJ Chunky and DJ LaRock at the Conflux Tap House. And then, of course, DJ Chris Moon at the Badland every Saturday. Um, if you want to learn more, you can go to MissoulaEvents.net. I am running out of time, and I want to thank you guys for joining me this morning. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph.